the screen, thinking with Charles Taylor, a Canadian-born uh, philosopher and philosopher of religion, uh, about secularization <coughs> and secularism, uh, and the sub title of his book is Monotheism. And of course, you might ask the typical question: How does this relate to our topic of spirituality? Yeah. Uh, but I think we will we will soon find out that this has uh, this has uh, quite a close relationship to the topic of spirituality because Taylor is asking the critical question: How is spirituality or the realm of transcendence even thinkable in today's world? of secular thinking, postmodern thinking. How can we talk credibly, sensibly, intelligibly about spirituality and trans transcendence as such, because that connects <coughs> spirituality, in a world where people may lack the language or even the, the you know, imaginative capacities to think about transcendence if they are locked in what Taylor says uh, uh, calls the trans uh, the imminent <laughs> people who are locked in what he calls an imminent frame have lost the capacity to even imagine the transcend any transcendent realm as such and to them spirituality is just a self-induced uh, you know, hallucination or a therapeutic self-help, <coughs> something that, that can help you subjectively if you choose to be spiritual, but that has no objective reality as such. So this is this is the main question uh, for Taylor, and he he comes with some solutions how we can talk about this sensibly. And I want to introduce to you some of his uh, ideas, but then also <coughs> criticize him uh, a little bit and offer some of my own solutions, how we might go forward with this. So let's begin with this uh, distinction between the various ways we can think about the word secular. And Taylor has three ways of defining secular. He says secular number one, back in the time of the enchanted world of medieval Christendom, the word secular refers to mundane, that means worldly, worldly activities that were not deemed sacred, such as farming, family life, domestic chores. That was secular. Even though the secular duties of the people living in this age were not considered their highest and most noble calling, the word secular had a positive meaning. Okay. So this is back in, in the medieval times, up, up until, let's say, the 16th or 17th century. <clears throat> then the second meaning of, of the secular emerged with uh, the, the coming of the Enlightenment. And uh, the second meaning refers to the public realm divested of transcendence, or as Taylor puts it, emptied of God, or, or of any reference to ultimate reality. Okay? So secularization in this second sense becomes an ideology, an intentional anti-religious and immanentist philosophy. Immanentist meaning the, what, what we feel, what we can observe, what we can investigate with our senses and uh, scientific instruments, that's what, what there is in reality. There is no reality beyond what we can actually explore. Okay? That's what immanentist means, as opposed to transcendent. So secularization becomes an ideology. Immanentist philosophy that champions humanity's upward journey of emancipation from its religious and mythical superstitions towards a universal neutrality 
of reason, science, and God. And then Taylor contends, and this is his suggestion, he says, we no longer live in secular one, but he also says, we no longer live in secular two either. Okay, in, post, in the postmodern time, Taylor says that we actually live in secular three, and that's a, that's a shift from secular two. Uh, the third meaning focuses on the conditions of belief in the Western nations today, especially in the West. And he says the shift to secularity in this sense consists, among other things, of a move from a society where belief in God is unchallenged and indeed unproblematic, as if in secular one, through the uh, condition where in secular two, Belief in God was just nonsensical and was outrageous and, 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 and you know, unsubstantiated, all the way to one in which it is understood to be one option among others, and frequently not the easiest one to embrace. But still, it's one option among others that can be considered. Okay. Secularization understood in the sense of lifting up to its proper place the value of our secular callings and commitments, or in other words, taking this world and our human flourishing in it seriously, is a natural effect of a mature Christian theology of creation. So we should not, Christians do not need to be afraid of this kind of secularization. In a sense, that the whole world and all of human efforts to cherish, protect, and beautify the world are sacred. So Taylor says, we can, we can live with this notion of secularization if it brings us back to take creation and also our social and political responsibilities seriously as believers. This kind of secularization that actually refocuses us back to the creative realm with all its, you know, problems, ambiguities, and pains is actually helpful and it's part of a well-understood Christian theology of creation. But what we should object, we should object uh, this uh, immanentist outlook and, uh, and we should fight against the secularization in the second sense, uh, in the sense of ideological secularism. And Taylor further says in his big work, uh, Secular Age, he says, Object objectification of the world gives a sense of power and control which is intensified by every victory of instrumental reason. We can come to see the growth of civilization or modernity as synonymous with the laying out of a closed, imminent frame. <clears throat> Within this, civilized values develop and a single-minded focus on the human good, aided by the fuller and fuller use of scientific reason, permits the greatest flourishing possible of human <coughs> beings. What emerges from all this is that we can either see the transcendent as a threat, a dangerous temptation, a distraction, or an obstacle to our greatest good. Right. So, many people, even today, the secularists would tend to look at the human progress that was partially you know, allowed or, or uh, was partially fueled by our technological invention, scientific, scientific progress, they would say, look, <coughs> humanity is so much better off because of this progress, right? When we focus on the imminent rather than on the transcendent. And so if, if this is the, the view of reality that we accept, then the transcendent might become an an obstacle or a dangerous temptation, you know, a threat, and so the uh, the secularists will then try to uh, 
get rid of this kind of notion and push it away from at least from the public realm. Epistemologically speaking, Taylor says, the imminent frame is a picture that holds us captive. It's a sensed context. It's not mainly a set of beliefs which we entertain about our situation, about our predicament, however it may have started out. Rather, it is the sensed context in which we develop our beliefs. So we cannot imagine the world being otherwise or being of a different nature, <clears throat> of having this kind of transcendent realm or, or aspect to it. It's something you know, out of our radar screen. And Taylor says an interesting thing, and he, he's, a, he's a Christian philosopher, but he can be critical, so critical to his own tradition. And here he says, this is his, from one of his younger works, I think he wrote this back in the 1960s, he says, the church's clericalism uh, and the narrow vision can be blamed for this, the emergence of this kind of immanentist outlook, or at least partially. In defense of humanism, <clears throat> the much younger Taylor complains, the church has done more to condemn humanist doctrines <clears throat> than it has tried to understand why all major <laughs> humanist doctrines of the modern era have been anti-Christian. And this is a huge problem. By humanist doctrine, he meant some view of man which tries to show the scope or the importance of human development towards greater well-being, freedom, unity, justice. All these views have been anti-Christian for at least one main reason, Taylor says, that Christianity has seemed to their protagonists a doctrine preaching the impossibility of human betterment or it's irrelevant. In other words, Christians didn't seem to, to take the world and its problems seriously enough. Okay? And now, when you go back to the 19th century, for example, the, the time of the First Vatican Council, when the European nations tried to solve you know, some of the, the, the huge crisis of within Europe, the social crisis in Europe. And these new ideas came about you know, democracy and human rights and human freedoms, freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, right? What did the church do at that time? It condemned all of these new developments. Okay, the first Vatican Council actually condemned the idea of freedom of conscience and freedom of religion and even democracy, okay, as something anti-Christian. Anti and so, obviously, to the modern intellectuals, Christianity uh, seemed to be this, you know, anti-modern, uh, reactionary, right, force. And so, these intellectuals did not s stop taking Christianity seriously as a viable intellectual solution. So Taylor, I think, is right in criticizing. <clears throat> now, obviously, we can, we can start with our own objections to this uh, kind of uh, secularist, immanentist outlook. And we can, we can say, first of all, this kind of exclusive immanentist humanism cannot be conclusively affirmed uh, by the epistemological tools we have at our disposal. Now, what does this mean? Let me give you an example. If the secularists claim that we can conclusively prove that there is no God, there is no transcendent realm, we can simply ask them, now prove it to us conclusively using your own scientific methodology. Okay? Give me some empirical proof that there is no transcendence, which they cannot do. When they say, when the secularists say, we can, we can conclusively s say or prove that there is no transcendence, there is no God, this is rather a philosophical statement, not a scientific one, okay? 
So that's that's one objection that we can we can come up with. The second one, it remains to be highly doubtful whether this exclusively secular imminent view of reality has the potential to provide adequate moral nourishment to guarantee its constitutive presuppositions. And let me show you what I mean by that. This is uh, this guy is from Germany, uh, a quite quite famous uh, German. Uh, well, he, he's a judge. Uh, on the, he served on the German Supreme Court for some time. He's also a philosopher and a Christian, uh, a conservative thinker, Ernst Wolfgang Beckenfelde. And, and he says this, and this, this has become his the, the so-called Beckenfelde dictum, and it's been widely talked about in, in Europe, but also in the US to some extent. Bill, do you, do you know this guy? Uh, or do you know both the problem that he has? Yes. Has mm -hmm. yeah. the he says the liberal secularized state is nourished by presuppositions that it cannot itself guarantee. That is the great gamble it has made for liberty's sake. On the one hand, it can only survive as a liberal state if the liberty it allows its citizens regulates itself from within on the basis of the moral substance of the individual and the homogeneity of the society. On the other hand, it cannot attempt to guarantee those inner regulatory forces by its own efforts, that is to say, with the instruments of legal coercion and authoritative command, without abandoning its liberalness and, at a secularized level, lapsing into the, that pretension of to totality out of which it led the way into the denominational civil wars. Okay, so the liberal secularized state is nourished by certain presuppositions about generally accepted values and standards okay, that it cannot itself guarantee. And Taylor is asking the same question and basically He's not directly quoting Beckenfeld, but, but he goes, he's in line with his thinking, and he asks this question uh, Are we living beyond our moral needs in our Western liberal societies that try to be so much you know, sort of anti Christian or, or objective that you know, we get rid of religion from the public realm? The question which arises from all this is whether we're not living beyond our moral needs in continuing allegiance to our standards <coughs> of justice and benevolence. Do we have ways of seeing good which are still credible to us, which are powerful enough <coughs> to sustain these standards? And he goes, he goes on in a different uh, work, uh, but he comes back to this idea, and he says, Modern liberal political culture is characterized by an affirmation of universal human rights. Rights to life, freedom, citizenship, self-realization, right? Which are seen as radically unconditional, okay? These are radically unconditional. They're as if they are woven into the reality of our society, of our world. So that's the presupposition. That is, they are not dependent on such things as gender, cultural belonging, civilizational development, or religious allegiance, which always limited them in the past. As long as we are living within the terms of Christendom, that is, of a civilization where the structures, institutions, and culture were all supposed to reflect the Christian nature of the society, we could never have attained this radical unconditionality, Taylor would claim. So these ideas that we take for granted, the liberal state for granted, they did not just pop up like that, you know. He says, Taylor says that it took some structures, it took the, the, the cultural substance, okay, for, for them to emerge and to become so self-evident. But if we lose that substrate, that culture, then those things will not remain so self-evident anymore. We can't simply claim them out of nothing. Right. 
right. So this is just to support the idea of the conspiracy. So Taylor says that if we want to keep these ideas alive, transcendence is the best hope for securing the continued commitment to humanism in its best in its best shape and form in the West. Transcendence is our best hope. The future of transcendence, and so here we come back to, to spirituality, uh, because transcendence may, uh, may be experienced by, by us in various ways. One of, well, one of these ways is through different spiritualities. Uh, but of course we can think about intellectual the transcendence intellectually and be open to it intellectually without having a distinct spirituality, which is less common, but it's possible. So again, transcendence is our best hope, he says. But the future of transcendence in the West hinges, according to Taylor, on whether or not a new vision of humanism becomes widely available or the dominant narrative of exclusive secular humanism continues to be the default and the only respectable or even imaginable position in the West. <clears throat> Is the possibility of self-transcendence without the other two dimensions of transcendence that Taylor lists, namely God and immortality, sufficient to avoid the stifling of the human spirit? And, and you know, Taylor is, is wrestling with this idea that uh, you know, the, the secular humanist would want to say, of course, we can speak about transcendence too, but it's just in the way of self-transcendence in a moral sense. So like, I deny myself my, my immediate needs for your sake, okay, for the sake of my neighbor, and in that way I transcend myself. So this imminent transcendence. Taylor is asking this critical question, is this enough? He distinguishes his understanding of the Christian version of a transcendent humanism from the secular versions by contrasting uh, the different responses to death and the details of the Christian vision of the transformation that breaks out of the imminent beyond. <coughs> Taylor's understanding of transcendence as transformation admits a weaker ontological reading one that allows for non-religious variants, at least as strong in transformative potential as any based on an original Judeo-Christian theism. This is, this is actually uh, debatable, and this is where I take issue with, with Taylor, whether this is actually possible. But he wants to be very inclusive. His monotheism, uh, at least the one that he wants to bring to the debate with the secularists and with uh, people from other religious traditions, he wants to stay as inclusive as possible. So he would want to claim, he would want to claim this, you know. Other, other systems of thoughts have the same transformative potential as the narrative, the meta narrative that is based on the Judeo-Christian tradition. Um, as long as we take transcendence within that narrative seriously enough. That, that Taylor see, would want to I, I don't want to interrupt you, but does he give an example? I mean, what, what's an example? He compares Christianity to Buddhism. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And he says that yeah, the Buddhist, uh, pr practicing Buddhist believers can attain the same level of transformation and can have, you know, can, can show the same kind of fruits as practicing Christians. So he would say, well, that is the same transformative potential, as an example. So, re renouncing or aiming beyond, renouncing oneself or aiming beyond life, not only takes you away, but brings you back to flourishing. So renunciation is what you need. This centers you in relation with God. But God's will is that human Humans flourish, and so you are taken back to an affirmation of this flourishing 
which is biblically called agape, and this agape is then targeted on, on the world's, on, the, on God's creation. So it brings you back to the world. Taylor's emphasis on self decentering or change in identity is read through the lens of the New Testament concept of kenosis, often explained in terms of disposition or emptying oneself for the sake of others. And here he becomes a bit more mystical and also a bit more uh, specifically Christian when he talks about agape and kenosis. Uh, and this is when he, he starts talking about the Christian transformative potential. Taylor consistently discusses Christianity and scripture and even theism in general as a best account of what it is to be human and to live the good life. An account that issues forth from the hermeneutical stance and that takes history seriously. Taylor also offers a so-called conceptual necessity transcendental argument. Until, he says, he says this, until there is a better account of the ontological status of a moral source of moral sources that is true to our moral experience, faithful to the phenomenology of being a moral agent, we should take them to be real, to be features of the world. Okay, conceptual necessity, transcendental argument. So, in other words, until you can come up with a world view that, and, and you can show me historically, experientially, that this new vision of reality can bring the same right life results as, let's say, the Judeo-Christian tradition has brought in, in establishing a certain culture that uh, enables the emergence of of a universal understanding of human rights, for example, okay? Unless you can come up with another vision of reality that can bring the same result and we can experientially test it, then we should stick to, to, to the traditional view, okay? <clears throat> Transcendence in the strong, that is openly Christian theistic sense, according to Taylor's sources of the self, can only be presented in a dialogue with secular humanism in the form of an exploration of objective order through what he calls personal resonance. And this is, again, an interesting idea on this side. He says, because there is no longer, you know, we live in a, in a postmodern age, and so because there is no longer a publicly accessible moral order, uh, our only access to sources is through personal resonance, and articulating these brings us into closer proximity or fuller contact with the source. So he's saying here that we no longer live in a world where we can take for, for, for granted certain uh, ideals, okay, certain ideas about what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's bad, you know, people will contest you on, on just about everything for anything. And uh, so, so he says we can no longer mm, appeal to something that we hold in common because we are so fragmented. So, so what do we do? Well, okay, so let's talk about things and let's see how it resonates as, as we give our account of what's going on around us and what's good and what's bad. Let's see how it resonates with you somehow internally, mystically, intuitively, and then we can, we can have a discussion on how well you know, these ideas resonate with us and, and we can move forward with that. That's this idea. So we're searching for the best account, right, that resonates the best with our moral intuition. And, and this is what I suggest, reading Taylor, I, I I kind of like this idea, even though I see potential problems there. But okay, if, if we can, if we should try what he's suggesting, then I, I suggest this approach: instead of a unilateral, uncritical support of one type of meta narrative, you know, Christian or whatever it might be, we must rather facilitate a competent and critical dialogue of meta narratives. So, comprehensive accounts of reality. 
And we can employ the following criteria in doing that. We can, we can uh, you know, check their comprehensiveness, that is, how complex our vision of reality is. Does it include all aspects of reality? Then the, their logical and nosological coherence, so logical coherence its claims, so, so do we contradict <laughs> Uh, each, uh, do we contradict ourselves with our claims, or, or are they logically coherent? And also, are they consistent with our best knowledge of reality? We can claim something based on our world view, but then, as a scientist, when I look uh, through the microscope or through the telescope, and I find out that reality really doesn't correspond to the way I see it, it doesn't correspond to what I believe about it, because it's just you know two different things, then perhaps it's not the best account of reality. Okay? So there has to be a logical and gnosiological coherence in the world view, right? And then existential relevance. Now, I can, I can come up with an interesting account of the universe, uh, and, and I, I, can, I can say that you know, the universe has no meaning, and our, my life is no, has no meaning, but can I live with such an account? Can I actually live as a moral agent that it makes <coughs> responsible actions with the, the account of reality that I'm proposing, that, that we should all adopt? Does it have any existential relevance? And I think this all can be, this all can, can, can uh, work quite well within what uh, Charles Taylor calls personal resonance. So we meet with these, with these other people who have a different vision of reality and, and hold a different world view and we can talk about their vision of reality and their world view and use these tools, these critical criteria and, and talk about how the criteria are being met in that world view and look for this kind of personal resonance. Uh, perhaps. This might be one, <laughs> one approach. <clears throat> Okay, um, and this is, this is uh, the end. So the contact with the source, conceived of in a Christian sense, uh, can amount to a powerful series of events that constitute the movement of the Spirit, who unites believers with the incarnate Logos in Christ Jesus. Now this is a specific Christian way of arguing now. This outwardly induced movement both in, in, in strong transcendence, ontologically, then yields acute experiential relevance for the human moral subject, reorienting him or her to a new level of human flourishing. So, in other words, if Christian, historical Christian communities can show to the world uh, a new kind of life in the Christian agape, in this canotic love, where we live for the sake of others, even at our own expense, then this can become, I'm talking here about sort of a, a rejuvenation of Christian communities. Uh, um, yeah. So this can become a great way of convincing <coughs> The world that our meta narrative is actually potent and very attractive and um, and viable, and so we can bring this to to the dialogue with our partners. <laughs> so um, we don't we don't need to do this. Um, thank you for your attention, and I will look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Dimitar. Katarina, please, you have the floor. <laughs> yeah. For what? <laughs> Coordinate. Coordinating. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, how much time do we have for discussions and for the presentations? As much time as we want? Or for we presentation, want to see 30 minutes. Okay. And for discussion, 20 minutes. Okay. Bay. Yes. Okay. <coughs> you want to see a medical fight? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, um, uh, 
this was quite a um, concise and I would say quite um, full presentation <laughs> uh, of uh, a view of Charles Taylor on uh, this problem. So um, I think all of us has made some notes and if there are any questions, so please we have 20 minutes, which is nice. This is just for clar clarification, but I don't understand the difference between secularity two and secularity three, mm -hmm. uh, unless the premise of secularity two is not only that you empty the public square of, of uh, transcendence, and, but that you're hostile to it in the private sphere as well, is that? And then it's three, you're, it's still empty, but you're not hostile to it in the private sphere. Yeah. Or because, I mean, Taylor's not saying is it in secularity three, it's, it's acceptable to bring religion or religious arguments back in the public square? <coughs> He's hoping that that's the case, I that see. the society okay. is moving in this direction, yes. Okay. So he is basically calling not only uh, the Christians or the religious people to assume this kind of thinking, we now live in secularity three, but he's also calling the secularists to admit that we now live in a, in a society that no longer blindly adheres to this dogma of secularism, but rather we see a new revival of religions globally, right? So the positivist, uh, you know, when sociology was sort of invented as a new field of study in the 19th century, and sociologists, positivists like uh, August Comte, you know, came with the idea that uh, religion is, is vanishing and the 20th century will see a sharp decline of religion and we will not need it anymore because we can you know will be so technologically and scientifically advanced that uh, intelli intelligent people and, and scientifically oriented people won't need religion to solve their life situation crisis and so on you know that that dogma or this kind of view has not been confirmed Right, the 20, 20th and 21st century sees a resurgence of religion. Right, so that's one of the bases on which Taylor can claim we now live in a secular free world where religion is taken seriously again, but as but different religions. So Christianity is one of the options of many religions on you know even in the public square because suddenly we have to deal with these religious motivation motives. Even if I, as a secularist, disagree, even if I want to claim I am an atheist, I have to take the power of religion seriously and talk about it publicly, because suddenly I see that I don't understand the world. What's going on? Why do people behave the way that they do? Why do the terrorists blow themselves up? And they, you know, they shout whatever they shout. So it's a religious motivation. So I, I as a secularist, I need to understand that. Okay? So, he says, you know, let's get used to this idea, we we'll live in the secular free, and it gives us some opportunities also, but it also gives us some limitations. We can't go back to secular one, where in the Christendom, Christianity was the only viable option, and it was not even disputable, it could not be even discussed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so it was Patrick and... Okay, okay. Uh, don't, don't be. Uh, I think it is a good uh, account of uh, Charles Taylor's understanding of secular, secular age. Thank you for that. Uh, perhaps you could also uh, explain uh, you know, his concepts of uh, the porous and the buffered selves to no. end up, you know, explain further the end of the secular, secularity that we are experiencing today. Very well to the Western neuroscientific context. 
field. But however, it is not without relevance for other places. Um, though it is characteristically kind of different. In the Indian context, one cannot actually think of these three types of right. secular yeah. secularism and things like that. Yeah. See? Yeah. Yes. So, but uh, something that uh, towards the end you conclude is very relevant. Like, you know, that uh, or what he himself said, can we have some kind of a personal resonance? Is he trying to think within the, what we call the, the narrative paradigm, the linguistic paradigm, which uh, proposes that what is possible for us is to have narratives, for and have narratives, rather than begin with, uh, say, ontological, secular reality, or the other way also. So, is it more to do with that kind of, uh, you know, linguistic framework, that is one question. The third question is, the phrase that you use, very, very clear, yeah, the strong, strong transcendence, okay? Now, what, what more has a good proposal of, uh, let's go for a weak anthology today, you see? Yeah. So anthology is there, but uh, you know, weak anthology, so as to dissuade the emergence of fundamentalism and other things. Sure. How do you relate your whole idea of strong transcendence weak knowledge? <laughs> yes. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the um, first question, of course, buffered self and core self, those are uh, important concepts in Taylor, and uh, it was just a lack of time that prevented me from, uh, you know, showing you, showing you all of this. But uh, the buffered self is, is native to secularity too, in, mm. in Taylor's uh, thinking. Mm. And, he, and, and he really criticizes this, uh, this kind of phenomena, phenomenon, where he says, you know, people who have adopted this, this kind of uh, uh, secularism, secularity too, uh, they live in a situation where their self is is buffered, is is somehow, uh, you know, protected or disconnected from uh, any notions or imaginations of the transcendent, <coughs> and and the self is uh, looks for the sources of 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 his own deliberation only inside of himself. Okay, instead of uh, being uh, uh, in, instead of uh, the, the self being willing to be uh, conditioned or somehow directly influenced by a transcendent reality. Okay, so a buffered self could not even imagine transcendence as, as something that's that's real, that's really there, and that could influence the self in any in any normative way. Uh, um, so I, I choose my own identity, uh, you know, it's my own de deliberation, I choose my, my moral standards, uh, I, I use uh, scientific reasoning to, to find out what the world is like and what I like about it, what I don't like about it, what kind of stance I take towards the world, it's all within me, all right? Uh, and Taylor says that this is a very limited and narrow view of reality. And he says that uh, instead of this kind of buffered self, uh, it is much more helpful and uh, healthy if we assume it, uh, not the approach, but the, if we could go back to the poorest self, where I become a self. <laughs> in a relationship with the other, and especially with the transcendent other, okay? I am conditioned, and my myself emerges in a conversation when I am actually approached by the other. And, and this actually ties well with, with your second question, this linguistic term, all right? How do I come to self-awareness? How do I get to call myself an I, right? I mean, well, because my parents, teach me language, my language, right? And they call me by name, and somehow, and this gives me the cognitive abilities to distinguish myself as opposed to the other who, is, who has a relationship with me. So myself only emerges out of this relationship. 
And it's, it's interesting that this is linguistically it is so. We, we understand this psychologically, this is, this is how it works. But then when we, when we talk about things like transcendence and we, we talk about human identity further on, we, we switch from this poorer self into the buffered self as if the other no longer had a constitutive function on how I, how I work internally. And I think that's, that's a pity. There is a contradiction there. So I, I see a huge contradiction uh, in, in the secular two view and in their insistence on the buffered self. Well, actually, they don't even speak about it. They, Taylor is the one who critically points out that, that the self of the modern man is a buffered self. The, the modern person would not even realize that, that they have this identity of the buffered self. They would take it for granted that this is the way we function. Yeah, we are objective, scientific, uh, moral agents and um, you know we don't we don't even need to think about the transcendence having having any bearing on my reasoning my moral judgments or, or anything uh, but, but i see a contradiction mm -hmm. so this is this is important in, in, in taylor and uh, this is why he says transcendence is the future you don't need to he says you don't need to be specifically christian but it would be better for humanity if we stay open, okay, if we stay open to the possibility of transcendence. And this is why he connected with Richard Kearney and with his, with his anatheism, you know, this, this new idea. It's something between agnosticism and atheism, and it's called anatheism, all right? Richard Kearney, he is this anatheism, yeah. Anatheism. That's it's in translation. It's beyond theism. Beyond theism. Yeah, but, so it's not atheism, and it's not agnosticism, but it's somewhere in between. It's like I would like to believe, but I'm I, I'm still very much in doubt that there is something to believe in. But I would like. Oh man, I'm open to to believe. This is this active search for something, and yet with one one leg I still stand in agnosticism. But boy, I'm so open to you know speaking. So it's this anatheism. And Kearney is one of his leading philosophers today. He's going to be at the World Congress of Philosophy in Beijing, and he's going to you know, speak about this doctrine. And Taylor had, had a wonderful, uh, and there is a book about this also, but he had a, he had a lengthy dialogue with, uh, uh, there is a dialogue between Charles Taylor and Richard Kearney uh, on these issues. And uh, they, they agree on many things. But of course, Taylor wants to move then to to uh, monotheism as something that resonates the best with the human general human experience, whereas Kearney would still be hesitant to go that far with uh, Okay, Professor Jones. Yeah, okay. uh, thank you very, very much for your presentation, Mikhail. Uh, I would like to think of the secularization tree as seems to me more of a, well, of course, it's a, a positive view of what's going to happen in the future. Mm -hmm. It seems to me like uh, hoping for the hoping for the better. Hoping for the better. And I would like to of course think along with him. But the way I look at it at the present time, I think we're still in the secular two thing. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Because when you when you look at it, uh, people see human flourishing as something that is outside of that experience of the transcendence, right? Uh, it's maybe we believers would think of human flourishing as something connected with the transcendent. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of people outside of our circle, and they are the majority, I would suppose, who it's still... And I see intellectuals, yes. There, who, there might be yeah, who are still... With, in, Within the you know within the gambit of the secular thing, so my question is, how can we even you know go into that secular three thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and as as I said when I answered to to Bill's uh, question, what what Taylor is saying, he is actually inviting both the religious people and the secularists to make this hopeful move or to start considering uh, themselves living in this you know kind of postmodern context that okay let's move to this this view of reality that we no longer live in secular two but we are now moving to secular three 
because, uh, and the secularists should admit this, we no longer live with this modern paradigm that we can conclusively say the reality is, is this is the nature of reality. And if, if the modernists, if the secularists want to claim that they know exactly what the nature of reality is, they're no longer, they're not postmodern, they're actually modern, and they go beyond their scientific methodology, and they, they become philosophers. Yeah, 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 but, but right? for me it's, it's not so, even... It's, but isn't this, isn't this the first step when you discuss, when you debate them? Yes, yes. 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 To, to call into question their own scientific methodology, and simply ask them, how can you, you know, you claim to be hard rock scientists, all right? You claim to use scientific methodology in determining, you know, what's, what the reality is like and how we should live and so on. Well, okay, but if you dogmatically maintain that the, the reality is, is, imman, is in, in, in its very nature imminent, there is no transcendence, that is no longer a scientific claim. So I don't want you to become a transcendentalist somehow, but I want you to at least admit that there is that transcendence is a viable possibility. And, and if you don't, then you become then you actually hold a dogmatic position, which is philosophical, not a scientific one. And I think this might be the first step in the debate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's that's valid within the debate. If you are yeah. debating with with a secularist, for example, who says this is my position, and we come. And this is our position. Oh. But the, the thing is that, the fact is that there are many people who are not intellectuals. I mean, they are the ones, they, they will not argue, they will not debate with you. But they are the ones living this secularist thing and we're just theorizing about their lives. Let me give you an example. Uh, our president, Duterte, calls God stupid. Okay? He's not intellectual. Okay. He's not an academician. Well, so, some of his uh, aims defend him by picturing him as an academician who's trying to, you know, uh, contest or question a particular theory about creation. But he is not an intellectual. So many of those people outside of our intellectual circles are the ones practicing this kind of life. So how do we even get, you know, get them to, you know, within our, our circle of debate? It's, it's easy to say, that we can debate with the, with the secularists, with the intellectuals, because they are within our circle. But the problem is, majority of people are not within our circle. Those who live in this kind of life, those who practice secular, or those who are into this secular thing, are not even aware of what <coughs> they are talking about. They are not even aware that they are in a world de defined by us as a secular world. Yeah, I, you know, Taylor is a communitarian, and I think, and, and again, here I would tend to side with him on this. I think what, what he would suggest, he would say, look at the historical communities, embodied, you know, communities <coughs> of Christians, where they live this kind of narrative, and look at the life results of these communities. How would people take care of each other, how they share their resources, how they take care of their sick and, and weak, you know, members of the community. You know what is the divorce rate? You know how well did they, you know, raise their children and so on. And if if you can if you can show that that the, these Christian communities have good life outcomes, that this example speaks much more, you know, to, to these these other you know people who are not intellectually inclined. These kind of examples will attract their attention much more than any argument that you can give them. So you know. Uh, you can argue on the intellectual level, but you can also argue with, with your life, the way you actually live this kind of vision of reality. Yeah, that's always my, you know, always my concern when we have this intellectual debate, because we, are, we, we seem to be in a bubble, inside a bubble. Yeah. And we are just, you know, like for example, this discussion here is like a bubble. We are inside a bubble, and we've been discussing and discussing Things like that, and people outside of this hall, outside of this conference, are the ones living their lives. And my my, my challenge when, when I give presentations, for example, when there are uh, fellow philosophers, for example, in my country, my, my challenge is always, how do we get out of this bubble? How do we get out of this room yeah. and make our discourses relevant to real people? I mean, people who are not into 
into our bubble. How do we break this bubble? Yeah. And you know, C.S. Lewis and, and J.R. Tolkien uh, are my favorite, belong to my favorite authors. Both of them use stories and imagination to break out of the bubble and invite people into their world. Okay? And I think that's a very good way. So I think it is time for us philosophers and theologians to start using stories and even fantasies, mm -hmm. you know, to project the kind of values and, and even life vision that we want the other people to see and even taste as they read those stories. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay, let's Perhaps. Do you want to add them to, uh, there are two more yeah. questions yeah. here, uh, Sergei. Oh. Uh, as I understood, the trailer says about uh, even accept Christianity about the openness to transcendence, yes? Mm -hmm. And in this way, uh, does he want to invent new kind of religion? No, what? No. He talks like this only when he is debating people from other faiths or the secularists. Then he, he would like to he would like to forsake his strong ontology Okay, he would want to claim that he is not now going to argue in, in a strong ontological sense for monotheism, but he would rather simply be, he would want the dialogical partners to be simply open to transcendence. Okay, without telling them directly the Christian story or narrative, at least not in the first, uh, as a first step. So he himself does not forsake his Christianity. Okay, he wants to remain a Christian, a monotheist, and, uh, and that. But, but when he debates uh, his partners, who are not Christian, then he, he steps away from the strong monotheistic ontology, and he would rather, uh, he would rather uh, you know, speak more on, on, on lesser terms, or more generally, more broadly. And so he invites the partners simply to talk about how they experience transcendence and what it does to their communities and so on. And then from there, you know, we may get further, and we, we may talk about stronger ontologies, perhaps. I saw the, I said about it uh, uh, earlier. This concept of actual age, we can speak about the roots, the main roots of all religions, and in this way solve this problem. Mm -hmm. And I have uh, one uh, sentence, maybe a paradoxical one and provocative, that uh, secure, secure, secular society. Uh, doesn't exist at all. Mm -hmm. you no, know, doesn't exist. Yeah. Because, as Hegel said, uh, uh, it's not a notion. We can't have such notion. You no, know, so it doesn't exist. It's only some transition mm -hmm. from Christian society to uh, other society. We don't know what society. Mm -hmm. But this is not society. Because the uh, uh, notion of uh, uh, this secular society is impossible. Yeah. Yeah. Because in each society, we must have some faith. Some faith. Uh, uh, society can't exist without faith. Any kind of faith. Mm -hmm. So how it can be uh, society without faith? It's impossible, you know. Or we can say about uh, returning to barbarism, to paganism and so on. Not secular, but new paganism. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have uh, a few questions directly related to it. It sounds good uh, from a history of philosophy perspective, from a, a, a solution to the basic problems of religion, you know, the philosophy of religion perspective. But some of the things I just uh, mentioned by Joe is that uh, uh, is it that. Uh, the basic problem here is, it sounds a little bit of like nostalgia. And the, uh, all uh, critique of the uh, secularism uh, comes from, uh, uh, from the perspective of a certain tradition and they see the difference between uh, all good old days and the <laughs> now this situation we are in and just overcoming that, it looks like uh, Charles Taylor is trying to be both inclusive of uh, <coughs> seculars mm -hmm. and also 
But the, the real problem is, uh, is I, I disagree with Sergey and you if you accept that you know, there is no, not such a thing as secular because they have a certain kind of belief. Is that too much abstraction? Because the human flourishing now is uh, judged uh, even at the level of you know, the kindergarten as a competitiveness between individuals. Who will get first? Who will become you know, the, uh, the king of this or the, the, the first, you know, king, among... Yes. King of the century. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. And, um, I, 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 you are, uh, you are well uh, informed in uh, yeah, this uh, problem. First question is how it is related to Harvey Cox's uh, secular city is a kind of a liberal apology that, okay, you just, you know, stay away with this similar uh, symbolic existence of what is left of religiosity mm. in the modern metropolitan cities, you know, you can have your church and, you know, uh, this and that, but uh, don't ask much about this uh, more like pluralistic society uh, and just uh, try to live with it. And how it is different in that sense, Charles Taylor's uh, from a Catholic perspective, uh, isn't that uh, too, uh, I mean, a, a real traditionalist Christian of, uh, say, a Catholic, you know, uh, order, we'll say, uh, compromising uh, of his tradition? Yeah, yeah that's, that's a good critical question. I am, I'm not quite sure if uh, I am, first of all, I am talking from a, uh, uh, I myself am not a Catholic, okay, I'm, uh, I'm originally an Lutheran, although I, I consider myself a, you know, an evangelical Catholic, so I, I love the Catholic tradition and all that, but uh, uh, so for me to somehow evaluate Charles Taylor's faithfulness to the Catholic tradition and, and whether he's going too far, you know, it, I can offer you some some subjective, uh, you know, sort of estimate or whatever, but it's very, very subjective and uh, you know not, not very well informed, I suppose. Uh, I think I think Taylor wants to read. He's a Catholic, okay, and uh, we met him. We met him personally in 2014, Katarina and I, when we were in Rome at a conference, uh, and uh, he he spoke there. He was one of the keynote speakers. And the conference was organized by, uh, or one of the co-organizers was a Catholic church there, uh, and, and you know several archbishops were there and so on. So Taylor is not considered, uh, you know, an official renegade or something, but he is somewhere on the borderline probably of Catholicism, with at least with some of his ideas, um, perhaps. Uh, you know, when he says that other narratives have. The same, even even a secular narrative can have the same transformative potential as Christian monotheism. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's a, that's a very strong statement, and I, I wonder if he's not going too far in saying that. Okay, so on one hand, he wants to become he wants to be pluralist, pluralist, and and especially in terms of the uh, sources for one's moral motivation, he wants to be a pluralist. On the other hand, he wants to stay a monotheist and a, and a Catholic Christian, right? And so there is a tension between these two. And I think his monotheism gets in the way of his pluralism. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think he solves that tension very well, ultimately. Uh, Secularism requires the, the equality of all symbols uh, in a uh, pluralistic uh, you know, society. Yeah. And he's, uh, he's uh, approaching it from uh, uh, a particular religious tradition and defining this uh, kind yeah. of uh, pluralism uh, yeah. through the yeah, lens or the, the, yeah, the... But perhaps he invites us to go a bit a step further, yeah. perhaps, if I understand him correctly. 
Uh, but even if I don't understand him correctly, here is my interpretation. Okay, I think what he is yeah, asking us to to do is to call this kind of secular vision of the society into question. Okay, he says if you secularists believe that religion is this you know, relatively unimportant phenomenon and you can you know, have your churches and mosques and whatever, you know, you have your temples and you can do it privately, you can even, you know, do it publicly, but, you know, just, just maintain peace and just, you know, do this in your communities and celebrate the, the differences. But it's not really important because, you know, we secularists keep an upper hand on it and we know what society should look like. You know, they act as if, I mean, that's, that's also an ideology, it's a pseudo-religion. It becomes this meta-narrative in their own hands, in their own making, that's actually competing with, with the Muslim or with the Christian meta-narrative of reality. But, only, but they want the secularists, in this sense, want, to, want us to, uh, to, to step away from, from actually you know, organizing the society and becoming the main voice. They still want to, be, they still want to remain uh, to be the main voice in the society. Right, so, and, and I think Taylor calls this into question and he says, look, we, we all live in a secular age. And so, you know, you as, as a Muslim, uh, myself as a Christian, we are secular because we are citizens of Turkey or Slovakia and we have our opportunities, our uh, responsibilities as citizens. So we are secular and as such, uh, we have our own visions of reality. and. These visions of reality, we should we should voice them. We should speak about them publicly, and we should we should also go into schools and go into the media and be very serious about how we view our the reality. And there should be a, a really an open and honest dialogue in the society about this. We should not be just shut in our mosques and churches, right? So why should we adopt the secularist vision of the society? Why? Why is it so self-evident? He says, it's not self-evident. And even if he doesn't say that, I would say it. <laughs> okay. Well, and we can go on and on and on, but we still have more people to listen to, and I invite you to debate further uh, during the breaks. And uh, I think we have even more time for debates now, which is...